Good to have George here with us this evening, our good friend from Melbourne. Aren't you from Melbourne? Yeah, okay, there we go. Yes. <laughs> the, um, the, I felt like the Panero children probably felt kind of cold here today. The George will feel hot from, from Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to another fellow this week. Mr. Coco was his name. Mr. Coco. And he said, oh, it's too hot here. He's come, come over from Melbourne. Oh, boy. Some people would complain if gold fell on them. <laughs> First Kings chapter 18 is a time when Elijah has a great victory. Victories are great, aren't they? I mean, it's wonderful to have a win. And uh, if you're familiar with the, uh, the history of this, in uh, chapter 18, the nation of Israel was hesitating in their following the Lord. In uh, verse 21 of 18, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Listen to this. And the people answered him not a word. Now I think, if you, as you read the rest of the story, you'll see that they're waiting to see who's going to win this battle. <laughs> then they'll be on that side. Uh, we're often like that, aren't we? Well, it, the Lord does win, of course. Uh, as they have the... The contest, you know, they, they both uh, put something on the altar and uh, the prophets of Baal spend all day asking their God to do something and of course he can't do anything because he doesn't exist. And then in verse 30, it, it, this is a great verse, the end of verse, he says, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. You know, that's, that's something we need to do regularly. We need to keep our, our relationship with the Lord right. And, of course, he puts some things on the altar. And, and then Elijah just prays. I have written in my Bible 63 words. His prayer is 63 words long. And God sends fire down in uh, uh, verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, they're no longer silent now, the Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. <laughs> they, were, they were on His side now. Well, it was a great victory. But in chapter 19, as often happens, following a great victory can come great trouble. A, a great mountain is often followed by a great valley. And let me just read the first two verses. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with, with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. So, Jezebel is very threatening to the prophet. All of a sudden, Elijah is in trouble for serving God. And you know, that's, that's not that uncommon. If you've ever tried to witness or do things for the Lord, it's not uncommon for people to give you a hard time for it. I remember we were out uh, door knocking and one of the men said that a lady said to him, surely a grown man like you could find something worthwhile to do rather than coming around bothering people. <laughs> you know, people don't always appreciate it when you try and save them from hell. Um, Margaret Court. You heard of Margaret Court? Yeah. Uh, now, there's probably a lot of things I wouldn't agree with that she does, but uh, she's taken some flack for standing for the Lord. She just very plainly says, we're against homosexual marriage, we're for godly marriage, you know, Bible marriage and so on. And, and people call that a controversial stand. I thought, isn't that interesting that, that nowadays, when you're against homosexual marriage, you're taking a controversial stand. Um, in, uh, in 1 Peter, he talks about that, how that, uh, he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a, a busybody. He says, you shouldn't be in trouble for doing wrong. But he says, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now, when you decide to live for the Lord, you can count on it. There'll be people who will oppose you. There'll be Jezebels. Now, there's, they're still around today. And uh, his response, I'm sorry to say in verse 3, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. <laughs> he ran. 
and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. I'm not exactly sure what he meant. I'm not better than my father's. I, I guess in a way we always think we're going to do better than what our parents did, but uh, he, he saw, well, I'm, I'm no different. But you know, his, his response, if you're uh, filling in the blanks there, number one is he, he runs away. Isn't that a common response when there's trouble? <laughs> Woo, he was out of there. Secondly, he isolated himself. Did you notice that? Uh, he left his servant there, and he himself went on alone. You know, that is really common uh, when we're discouraged, it is to, to run away from the problem and to isolate ourselves, to get ourselves away from really those that could, could, could help us. Uh, many times, uh, you know, people will quit uh, communicating with their family. They'll, they'll sometimes even quit coming to church and things like that when they're in trouble. That's the time when you really need to, to gather up. And then the third thing he does, he moans. <laughs> uh, that's probably not a Bible word. That, that is the singular of murmur, <laughs> right? When you get a group of people moaning, it's called murmuring. Uh, he complains. He gets off and, Lord, just, just kill me. I've had enough. Of course, none of us would ever do any of these things. He runs away, he isolates himself, and he com complains, he moans. Well, what does God do? God always has a response. In verse 5, As he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. He slept again. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. God refreshes him. What a, what a blessing it is to know that in our distress, uh, he's our, our shepherd. He is our good and, and kind God. Uh, God lets him sleep. Here he is moaning and complaining at God. <laughs> and God says, well, just, just take, take a rest there. And he provides for him. He refreshes him. And then God rebukes him. In, in verse 9, he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, this is God, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And here's the same song, second verse. He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. We'll just stop reading there. You know, the Lord gets Elijah apart, and, and he just asks him a question. Isn't it funny how rebuking it can be sometimes just to have a simple question asked? What are you doing here? <laughs> I remember, I've had that asked a few times in my life. And, uh, you know, the, usually it's asked because you're somewhere where you shouldn't be. But, you know, it's a question we should ask ourselves regularly. What am I doing here? You know, why am I here? Not necessarily that we're in the wrong place, but what are we doing here? Uh, Elijah had been focusing on self. Anytime we're moaning and groaning like he was, um, you know, that's the problem. And at least part of what he was believing was not true. You know, he kept saying, I'm the only one. Well, we'll get down to verse 18 when the Lord tells him, there's 7,000 people left. And God's question to Elijah is an important one that 
I think we need to consider regularly, what doest thou here? What are you doing here? What's going on in your life at this time and this place? You know, it's too easy to look back and look forward and not live now. You know, God is the great I am. He's here. And God knows the past and God knows the future, but, you know, we don't really live the past and the future. We, we have to live now. <laughs> and uh, so many opportunities are missed because we're waiting for the, the next one. Now, I'm not a surfer, but, you know, I see these guys out in the waves. Man, there's wave after wave. How do they know which one to take? I don't know. But they've got to eventually take one, don't they? <laughs> you know, what, what am I doing here? And, uh, you know, with life, we can't just keep waiting. We can't just keep looking back and saying, oh, it was better than... Oh, the leeks and garlics of each. <laughs> you know, uh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Uh, listen, we need to live now. We need to live for the Lord now. What are we doing? You know, some, some of you are moving. And that's, you know, the Lord knows. He moves people here and there in different places. You serve the Lord when you get there. But listen, right now you're here. <laughs> you might only be here another five days. You might only be here another few weeks. Some of us, you know, we could go into glory tomorrow. We don't know. What am I doing here? Well, God asks Elijah that question, and he gives him some instructions there. Uh, the, the third point there is God gives Elijah a purpose. God gives Elijah a purpose. The Lord said unto him, verse 15, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. Now, he had said to him before, go. It was back in, uh, what was it, verse 11. Go forth and stand upon the mount. And he just kind of gave him a visual illustration all these magnificent things, and God wasn't in those. God was in the still, small voice. <laughs> you know, we, we like the grand and the wonderful. Sometimes it's just the little voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to our heart that, that is the main thing that's going to change us. You know, it's not going to be some uh, magnificent situation or experience. A lot of times the world, especially in religion, they're looking for experiences. Well, God speaks to us through his still, small voice and through his word. And uh, God gives Elijah a purpose. He first of all tells him in verse 11, go and stand before the Lord. That's a good place to be. We're, we're there anyway. We just need to realize it, really. Go and stand before the Lord. And uh, then in verse 15, he, he basically is telling him, go return and serve the Lord. Let, let's read it. Boy, there's some important things he's going to do here. Verse 15, go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Yehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Wow, three important appointments that he's going to be making. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Yehu slay him. Him that escapeth from the sword of Yehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. God gives Elijah a purpose. He gives him a, a plan. You know, our lives have purpose because of the Lord. Not because of our plans, but because of what God is doing. You know, sometimes God will do things that we just can't change. You know, there, there might be things we wish. You know, the world is so silly sometimes. Just, if you just want it enough, you can have it. Listen, it's just not true. It's just not true. Now, effort counts and, you know, wanting and doing and all of that, you know, that's, effort makes a difference. But, you know, just because you want something doesn't mean it's going to be so. If wishing would make it so, a world, we'd be in a messed up world, I'll tell you what. Uh, go return it and serve the Lord, God tells him. And he gives him three important things that he's going to be doing. Yeah, you know, we don't know what God has for us. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 that he, his goal was to serve the Lord whether by life or by death. You know, we often think, oh, I could do this, I could do this. You, you know, the Lord might just say, well, I'm just going to take you home. I'm just going to make you a blessing in that way. Whether to, you know, whether to live or die is, is up to God. Our purpose is to glorify God. He says in 1 Corinthians, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, those sound like just trivial things almost, don't they? But listen, you've got to eat and drink. <laughs> They're important things. And God says, do it for the glory of God. Not for the glory of you, for the glory of God. And if those basic things are for the glory of God, of course, what do you say? Everything. 
whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. In Matthew, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And we oftentimes live for things. We think that you know, the one that ends up with the most things wins. <laughs> now, uh, the problem with things is uh, they own us rather than us owning them. Now, we need to live for the glory of God. And in talking about discouragement, the right way to deal with discouragement is God's way. And God's way is for us to keep living for Him. You know, I've heard it said that even just dealing with something as simple as depression, it, it hits everybody. Just keep doing what you know is right. You know, the problem with, with discouragement and depression is we think, oh, I'm, I'm too tired. I, I'm too discouraged to do that. So we quit doing that. And then pretty soon we quit doing this. And then, and then pretty soon we're discouraged because we haven't done this and we haven't done that. <laughs> and, and it snowballs on us. Just keep doing what you know is right. I mean, simple things like, Going to bed, getting up, brushing your teeth, going to work, speaking kindly to people, you know, preparing. Just do the things you know are right. It doesn't, you don't have to have a grand plan of you know, what's going to happen in 50 years. Just do it, what you know is right. That's all God was asking Elijah to do. Elijah, just go do what's right. What are you doing here? I've got a purpose. I've got a plan for you. you know, discouragement hits everybody. Give me a little definition there. To lose hope, uh, to lack the desire to move forward, to lack desire to live by your convictions. Uh, we've all been there. Everybody has mild discouragements. It affects us emotionally. Some have major discouragements, and, and it can affect our spirit, you know, our very inner man, and other people will notice. And if it's not dealt with in a godly way, it can become disabling. It can. And there's, there's a couple of things that are the main causes for Christians of discouragement. Number one is Satan's lies. Satan's lies. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that Satan lies. Jesus described him as a liar. Uh, he's called in, uh, in 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, it talks about his lying wonders. Uh, he's a deceiver. It's what his name means. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, verse, verses 11 and 12, Ephesians chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 11. In, in Peter, while you're turning there, the Lord says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, adversary, that should give us a clue what's going on here. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He warns us. And here in Ephesians 6, verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, this isn't a costume we're putting on. This is not a game that we're playing. When God says put on the armor of God, it's because we're in a fight and we have an adversary. But I want you to notice verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Keep that phrase in mind. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And he says, wherefore, that, that's why you put on the, the whole armor of God. You know, Satan lies to us. He's a deceiver. It's a major cause of discouragement because we have this lie in our mind and it's, it's not happening. Secondly, we get discouraged because we put down the shield of faith. We put down the shield of faith. If you're still there in Ephesians 6, look at verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Now here's the warranty with it. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty good... Uh, this is uh, something we need, isn't it? When we get discouraged, it's because we're believing Satan's lies. We're letting them hit us in our lives. God says the, the shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, you know, we live sinfully, we live selfishly, and we say, oh, I can't understand why, you know, I'm, I'm so discouraged. Uh, you know, as Christians, that's an unnatural way for us to live. Uh, feelings are not the most important thing about our life. The truth is, let me say that again, it's not our feelings that are the most important, it's the truth. 
You know, there, there are some benefits of discouragement. Number one, it confirms our need for God. Um, there's a, a book here that you might want to borrow. It's in our church library. You'll get through this. I just like the title of it. You'll get through this. You know, that's true for us as Christians. You'll get through this. Uh, he, he talks a lot about Joseph. You're welcome to check that out. Um, and one of the things he, he says is, you know, when they, his brothers threw him down in the, in the pit, when you get down in the pit, the only way you can look is up. <laughs> there's, a benefit, there's a benefit to that. Uh, it confirms our need for God. We cry out help. We see, I need help. The other than that, many times we think we don't need help. You hear these people talk about, they're a self-made man. Oh, man, it's so arrogant, isn't it? Um, but secondly, it brings us to God's plan. It brings us to God's plan. You know, when we uh, get discouraged, when we have difficulties, sometimes we just have to stop and think, well, my way is not working. What do they say? The definition of insanity is when you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. <laughs> we do that a lot, don't we? And we just think, oh, it'll work this time. Oh, it'll work this time. Oh, it'll work this time. <laughs> and we keep getting the same results. Uh, it brings us to God's plan. We finally think, maybe I should try something else. Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul is a great man of God. There's some wonderful people in, in Scripture, and he's one of them. Paul had a discouragement. Probably more than one, but one was a physical ailment. The Bible doesn't tell us what it was. He called it a, a thorn in the flesh. I find it interesting. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 12 that he asked God three times to take it away. I thought, man, that's me. I'd asked him a hundred times. <laughs> I've been all the time asking him. But he particularly three times asked the Lord specifically to take this problem away from him. You know the answer. God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Man, that wasn't the answer he was expecting. You know, when, when we have a discouragement, we have a, a trouble, that, that's not the answer we expect. Paul, I, I'm not going to take that away because this weakness is what's going to make you strong. This weakness is going to make you rely on my strength rather than your own. You know, that, that happens. I, I know more than one person whose ministry is based on a problem that they have. They went through a deep valley, and, and God gave them the resources. They, they, called, they went to the well of, of God's hope and God's blessing, and they, they saw what God could do. And God gave them a ministry to others from the well of God's, God's hope. In their weakness, they're, they're made strong. It brings us to, to God's plan. And, and Paul's response then was, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Man, I, f I, would, I find that hard to say. But let me tell you, I've got some infirmities. And I've been struggling with them. It's hard for me to say, I glory in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Maybe that's why the power of Christ is not resting upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Whoa, can you say that? In, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know, the problem with the ministry is we just don't get out of the way enough. We, we think, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. You ever had a little kid trying to help you with a job? Oh, let me help, let me help. And, and they get in the way, you know. And, uh, it's, it's good, we love kids and everything. But you know, it's kind of like that with us and the Lord. We want our way. Oh, let me do it my way. If we just let him work through us, he can do so much more. You know, when you're discouraged, one of the things you need to ask yourself, you won't say Elijah, but your name, what doest thou here? What am I doing here? Now, sometimes we're in the wrong place. Um, let me just lighten the mood here a little bit. Um, it's like the, the husband, he came home, and his, his wife said uh, she'd been so discouraged. She said, I was just down in the dumps. She said, so I, I bought a hat, and I feel a lot better. He said, I always wondered where you got those hats. <laughs> anyway, um, sometimes we're just in the wrong place. You know, if, if you're down in the dumps, you need to ask yourself, what are you doing there? Really, what are you doing there? We don't have to be there as Christians. God says we can, we can rejoice. 
And again I say rejoice. <laughs> in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know, we, we need to come to God's plan. We get so caught up with, with our plans. Philippians chapter 4.13 is a great verse that we love. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And, and we forget about the through Christ. <laughs> you know, it's through the Lord that, that things are going to be accomplished. In Galatians 6, he says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Yeah, God wants to do something with us. Let's see if I can get this straight. I, I heard somebody say there's three, or maybe he said four, but I can only remember three, three kinds of people. Those that make things happen. Those that watch things happen. And those that wonder what happened. <laughs> we don't want to be that kind of person. We want to be people who have knowledge and understand the, the will of God. Uh, it'll bring us to God's plan. Discouragement, God can use it for good. Keep doing what's right. Don't believe Satan's lies. Keep trusting the Lord. Now, I've listed ten things there, and uh, we've got ten minutes, so that we'll easy co cover that. Dealing with discouragement. Number one is remove any guilt. Sometimes the reason we're discouraged is not the outside circumstances. Sometimes it stems from within. We're, we have something that we haven't gotten right either with God or, or with man. Uh, you know, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Uh, if we've wronged people, get it right with people. I was talking to someone just this last week who, who'd hurt someone, physically hurt them, and, and I said, uh, you know, you need to go ask them to forgive you. You need to tell them you're wrong and ask them to forgive you. Oh, I couldn't do that. You, you know, we're so brave when it comes to doing wrong. We need to be brave when it comes to doing right. And we need to understand God's forgiveness. We get so used to the world's idea of forgiveness that you earn it or you deserve it. You hear people saying all the time, yeah, we, we deserve that. Uh, listen, if we got what we deserve, we, we wouldn't be here tonight. We wouldn't be blessed. Uh, we'd be in hell. Uh, the Bible tells us about forgiveness over and over, but my, one of my favorite verses is 1 John 1, 7. When he talks about as a Christian, he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And that's talking about you and Christ. It's not you and me and John. It's, it's John and Christ and me and Christ. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's a precious, precious verse. I'm told, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm told that that, that cleansing is present, continuous action. Present, continuous action. He cleanses, he cleanses, he cleanses. He's, he's keeping us clean. The blood of Jesus Christ wasn't just good on the cross. It's good for all time. And when you confessed your sin and trusted Christ as your Savior, he forgave you all your sin. And, and as you live your life, he, he keeps you clean. Now you need to keep agreeing with him. But you need to understand God's forgiveness. Uh, it, it's Romans 8.1, great verse. Uh, There's therefore now no condemnation to them which in Christ Jesus. What a blessing. So number one, remove any guilt. Secondly, take up the shield of faith. You know, he says there in Ephesians 6, above all, taking the shield of faith. And that, part of that's negative. Recognize Satan's lies. The other part is positive. Verbally quote and receive God's truth. I've given you some examples there. God has left you. That's a lie from the devil. If you're a Christian, God has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I asked you earlier, where's that found? Hebrews 13, 5. You know, things are going on and, and you're thinking, man, this is terrible. Nothing good could come of this. God says all things work together for good to them that love God. We need to look for what God is doing. You know, we get so upset with people and, man, I'm done with people. People just hurt you. God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Listen, if you're having trouble with people, people aren't really the problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual battle. People might say, oh, God's punishing you. You know, that, that's not a bad thing. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Others say, oh, you know, kind of a corollary. Oh, I don't deserve this. Listen, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's by God's mercy that we can have forgiveness. It's not what we deserve. Satan's lies, you have no strength. Christ said to Paul, the Lord said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What we're talking about when we're talking about taking up the shield of faith is using the Bible. 
Most of us treat the Bible like an unopened tin of paint. We know it's there, and we know we could paint the house, but we don't. You've got to use it. You've got to open it up. You've got to know specific verses. It's not good enough to say, I believe the Bible. Like the fellow said, I believe it from cover to cover. And he said, I even believe the cover. <laughs> it's not good enough just to have a general belief. You need to believe it specifically. When he says, confess our sins, the blood of Christ cleanses us, the, the peace that passes understanding. You can go on and on, couldn't you? You have to know the specific promises and claim them. Live by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What a blessing that God has revealed the truth to us. That's how we need to live. That's faith. Remove guilt. Take up the shield of faith. Thirdly, encourage your heart in the Lord. If you don't know what that means, find out. <laughs> Work it out. You're adults. You can figure it out. Uh, pray, read your Bible, sing. You know, I, I find it helps. Uh, even just smiling at yourself. You ever done that? Might scare you. I don't know. <laughs> if you see me driving along in my car looking in the mirror, oh, man. <laughs> Uh, he's, he's not uh, praising himself. He's trying to encourage himself. Let God's spirit speak to your spirit. Meditate on God's truth. Don't let the world's thoughts poke in. Yeah, I, 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 I'm even in Christians' homes sometimes where they they're let the, the world's music and the world's philosophies flow through their home. You know, television and radio and tapes and, and so on. You see all these people with... Uh, with things on their ears. I'm sure they're listening to Spurgeon's sermons and, you know, my sermons. And s no, most of them are listening to rubbish, aren't they? Don't, don't do that. Encourage your heart in the Lord. Be careful what you, you're, you're thinking and, and, and doing. Fourthly, focus on your position in Christ. That's, that's a big subject, more than we can cover tonight. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Yeah, a person who gets saved, the Bible says you're in Christ. Uh, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. There's a promise. We don't have to just live by our faith. We live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What a blessing. Uh, we have a list that we've made available from time to time called My Identity in Jesus. Some of you have seen this. I, I love this thing. Somebody else put this together. I just copied it off. Um, a lot of different areas that God says are true when you're a Christian. Uh, I have a list in the back of my Bible called, you can't read it from there obviously, but I know who I am. And it must be 50 different references as to what God says about me as a believer. I'm, a, I'm God's child. I'm Christ's friend. I'm united with the Lord. I'm bought with a price. I'm a saint. And each one has the verse that, that goes with it. You need to focus on your position in Christ. You need to know who you are in Christ. That will encourage you. Fifthly, offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. And the reason we put it like that is that's how the Bible puts it. Hebrews 13, verse 15. You know, as New Testament Christians, we don't, we don't have an altar here where we offer sheep and blood sacrifices. Christ was the permanent, perfect sacrifice. We don't have to do that anymore. But the sacrifice, one of the sacrifices we can give, besides our own body, is verse 15 of chapter 13, Hebrews. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, in case you didn't understand it, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's the sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. You know, there's no end to what we can praise and thank God for. The Bible says, in everything, give thanks. There's always something we can find that we can thank and praise the Lord for. Sixthly, set up a place to be alone with God. Now this is not, not saying isolate yourself, but it's saying every day you need to, to have time with the Lord. Uh, the, the Wesleys, you might have heard of John and Charles Wesley, or famous men of God of several centuries ago. They came from a very large family, and uh, I, I couldn't remember, I didn't bother to look at it, I think it was 10 or 20 kids in the house, I, I can't remember. Uh, but they knew that when their mother put her apron over her head, she was alone with God. When you have 15 kids running around the house, you know, it's not going to be quiet too often. But when mom put her apron over her head, 
You didn't, you didn't mess with her. That, she was, that was her time to, to be with the Lord. Now, I think you can find a better place than that. Um, at our homes, it's not hard when only two of you live in there and no dog or cat. Um, but Jesus, the Bible said in Mark 1, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. You need to have some time alone with the Lord. You need to have it every day, uh, more than once a day if you, if you can. And, and really, you don't have to be alone to be alone with the Lord. Number seven, remove yourself from fearful people as much as possible. The book of Proverbs, he talks about not going with angry people. And it's the same is true uh, with, with people who are not people of faith. And it doesn't mean you can't minister to them, but you don't want them leading you. Uh, remove yourself from fearful people as much as possible. Read biographies of great Christians. Some of those will be in the Bible. If you just read your Bible, you'll read about some great Christians. Uh, there's other books. And one of the things you'll find when you read about other Christians, they have trouble too. I remember reading about one famous missionary. I think it was, I can't remember how long it was. It was like a month. And every day he'd just go and sit on the mountain and mope. He just, he just felt like he was a failure. He felt like he couldn't do anything. And he, would just, he just was paralyzed. He just couldn't, couldn't do it. He's a famous, famous man. I think it was Adoniram Judson or one of those guys, William Carey. Um, but he, he made his way through it. There's dry times. There's tough times. But God is faithful. Uh, number nine, overcome the pride of not telling your pastor or for children, your parents or, or friends that you're discouraged and need, need their, their prayers. You know, it's all right to ask for help. We don't have to isolate ourselves. And then finally, study how God can use your problem or pressures for his good. We're not at the end of the road here. There's more to come. God is still working. And I, I find that really, often in reality as Christians, we don't really believe Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good. We know the philosophy, but when those things happen, we don't think, great, this is something good God is going to do with this. Uh, and it's hard. I, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm preaching more to myself than to you tonight. Uh, we need to believe Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And then he says, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Listen, Jesus didn't have it easy. Keep the faith. Now, there, there'll be lots of pressures. There'll be lots of problems, discouragements. Uh, they'll come. But the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater than any problem. Greater than any discouragement. Greater than Satan and his power. And listen, he, he's a mighty angel. A mighty uh, power involved there. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And I would close with this two questions tonight. Number one, is he in you? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Is are you saved? Do you have Jesus Christ as your Savior? Uh, and maybe turning it around, uh, like seven, Second Corinthians says, therefore if any man be in Christ, are you in him? Do you know Jesus Christ? Are, are you wrapped up in him? Do you have that relationship, uh, both human and eternal, that God can, can see you through? You know, when, uh, when little children come to my door and, and want to sell things. So I, I try to help them out. But listen, the children I'm mainly concerned about are my children. <laughs> and they call me, oh, Dad, we got a problem. Man, we, we want to help them. And, you know, God will help anyone. God will, can answer the prayers of anyone. But the only ones he promises to answer are his children. And you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says that he, he makes you his child. You, you become a part of his family. That's so important that you have that that permanent relationship with him. Well, that's a lot of material tonight. That's why I wrote it down, so you can take it home and, and ponder it. We're going to close with this song. It's page 180 in our songbook. God will take care of you.